Well, good morning. This morning we are in Mark chapter 14, and we're going to look at what has become my absolute favorite scene to point to. Whenever I'm talking with individuals or groups of people who are struggling with deep places of shame. And as you know, I just finished up the 22-room intensive, talking with guys, helping them really dive into the impact that their deceptive sexuality has had in their family, especially with their wife. And so on Sunday morning two weeks ago in our worship time, this is where I went. Because the reality is, I remember Dr. Larry Crabb making a statement 20 plus years ago when I went to a school of spiritual direction that has stuck with me. You've heard, many of you have heard me say this multiple times before. He said, it's only the Christian who truly has the resources to honestly look at his depravity. Now think about that for a minute. It's only the Christian, only those of us who know that we have been washed, cleansed, made whole in Jesus Christ, who have the ability to look honestly at how deep our darkness goes. And this morning's passage is one that I think helps crystallize that reality in a beautiful, powerful way. Because this morning we're going to see Jesus do something unthinkable for someone who is in the very act of doing the most wicked and vile thing imaginable. And that was Judas' betrayal of Jesus. So let's back up a little bit. Let's start looking at the story in Mark chapter 14 and verse 41. The context here is that Jesus is in his night of prayerful agony. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has brought Peter, James, and John. He's brought all the disciples, minus Judas, of course. He's brought eight of them part of the way. Then he's had them stop. And then he brought Peter, James, and John a little bit further on. And he said, here, stay here, watch and pray. He's asking them to pray, I think, primarily for themselves, but also possibly praying for him. In fact, it's the only hint we have anywhere in the Gospels of Jesus asking the disciples to do something for him. And yet, as we know the story, he goes back to check on them, not once, not twice, but as we'll see in a moment, three times, and each time he finds them not praying, but sleeping. So in verse 41, we have the story continuing. It says, returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now again, as we looked at a few weeks ago, it's helpful for us to imagine the geographical scene here. If you ever get the opportunity to go to Israel... One of the most striking scenes you can have is by walking up on the Mount of Olives to where they believe the Garden of Gethsemane was. Because the Garden of Gethsemane is on the top, (coughs) on the hillside close to the top of the Mount of Olives, facing the Temple Mound. And in between the Mount of Olives and the Temple Mound is what's called the Kidron Valley. And so if you can imagine two mountains, not Colorado mountains, but definitely mountains of sorts, with a steep canyon between them, that's the scene. So why is that helpful? Well, because I want you to imagine as Jesus spends this night in prayer, he is watching, every time he looks up, he can see the Temple Mound. And so, starting several hours prior to this point we're at, Jesus has looked up multiple times only to see a mob of lights start moving toward him. He could visually see them as they went down the mountain in the switchbacks, the Mount 
the temple mound. Temporarily losing sight of them as they get to the bottom of the Kidron Valley. And then probably shortly before this moment that we are in, in Mark chapter 14, he can see the lights off in the distance moving closer. And then as we get to this point in verse 42 and 43, we see this incredible transition happening. Because as he wakes the disciples up, he says, look, my hour has come. Here comes my betrayer. This mob of lights has now moved close enough that you have been able to make out the robes and the garments that identified the different players. There were the temple guard. There was a few Roman soldiers. There were the priests. But then the most horrifying sight happens as this mob of lights moves close enough in the darkness that you can make out the faces, the face of the one leading them. <coughs> and at the head of the mob is not an enemy, not even a stranger, but an incredibly close friend. Look at verse 43. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders. Again, it's not an enemy. It's not a stranger. It's Judas. Now, to you and I, the name Judas just is synonymous with traitor, synonymous with betrayer. But remember, for Jesus and the disciples in this day, Judas was a beloved one of the twelve. He had spent the past three years traveling with Jesus. He had seen his miracles. He had seen Jesus raise the dead, calm the sea, make the blind see, the lame walk. Judas had seen Jesus perform miracle after miracle after miracle. Judas had spent days walking the road, hearing Jesus teach. He had spent nights sleeping on the ground beside Jesus. And now here he is, leading the very mob that is going to arrest, try, and crucify him. Verse 44, now the betrayer had arranged the signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him and lead him away under guard. Again, imagine this. Imagine this reality. Judas has arranged a signal with this mob. I will identify him by giving him the affectionate kiss that a disciple gives his rabbi. Again, in Jesus' day, a student would approach his rabbi and give him an honorable kiss on each cheek as a sign of devotion, as a sign of respect, as a sign of love. And here is Judas using the rabbi's kiss to hand Jesus over for his betrayal. Verse 45, 45, going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and yet you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus when they seized him. He fled naked, leaving his garment behind. There is so much we can dive into in this, short, in this little bit of the passion narrative. But where I want to focus this morning is on four very four 
common responses to Jesus. And the first response I want us to see is that one of them betrayed him. And as we look at Judas, the one who betrayed him, I want us to notice five things that make his betrayal especially painful. First of all, as we've alluded to, he was a friend. He was one of the twelve. He was as close to Jesus as anyone outside of Peter, James, and John. He was a three-year companion. He was one who supposedly had bought in. And yet here he is now betraying his friend. Betrayal is painful in any context. But the closer the relationship, the more dependent, the closer, more intimate the relationship is, the greater the pain of the betrayal. And here is Judas, one of the twelve, betraying Jesus. Secondly, notice that it was arranged ahead of time. It wasn't that Judas got upset and angry at Jesus and in a heat of passion in a moment did something stupid. It was premeditated. He went to the chief priests earlier and devised a plan. He was warned by Jesus what was happening. He had multiple opportunities to say, what am I thinking? I can't do this. And yet at every moment, he just continued moving forward. But then third, notice that it was accomplished at night. Again, look at verses 48 and 49 again. Jesus said, am I leading a rebellion? That you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. I mean, think about that for a moment. Jesus was right there in the temple. Every day. He wasn't in hiding. He wasn't elusive. He was right there and available. So why do they wait to do it at night? Well, mainly because they were afraid of the crowd. But then secondly, also think about it, these things really have to have darkness, don't they? It was accomplished at night. But then fourth, notice that he addresses Jesus with that title of respect of rabbi. Again, as we noted just referring to Jesus as rabbi is so much more than what we think of. You know, rabbi, yes, means teacher. But in our culture, in our world today, teacher means I stand before you, I present information to you, and you take and choose what you want to take and choose. In Jesus' day, rabbi, while meaning teacher, was a different kind of teacher than we think of today. To commit yourself to a rabbi meant, Rabbi, I want to be like you. Let me spend time with you. Let me live life with you so that I can walk like you, talk like you, think like you, eat like you, pray like you. Judas had given himself to Jesus as his rabbi. He said, Jesus, I want to be like you. And in this moment of betrayal, he addresses Jesus with that title of respect, Rabbi. In other words, continuing to express his desire to be like Jesus. Only in this moment, it's not a desire to be like Jesus. It's a signal to those who are there to arrest him. And then finally, fifth, notice that it was accomplished with a kiss of friendship. 
a kiss on both cheeks, a sign of affection, a sign of respect, a sign of devotion. And yet all of it is turned upside down because it is being used for betrayal. So one betrayed him. Notice another defended him. Again, look at verse 47. It says, Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Other gospel accounts tell us it was Peter and that he cut off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. Now, this is so fitting for Peter. Because remember, Peter at the Last Supper had adamantly declared, Jesus, even if all deny you, I will never deny you. He says, Jesus, I will give my life for you. (coughs) And this instance proves that Peter meant exactly what he said. Peter was more than willing to fight and to even die for his image of the Messiah. Peter pulls out his sword, and let's think about it for a moment. How stupid was it for Peter to pull out his sword? Okay, first of all, what do you think Peter's swordsmanship skills are? Well, obviously not a lot, because do you think he was aiming for Malchus's ear? Of course not. He was trying to take off his head. But Peter is slow with a sword. So all he does is he clips his ear off. Now think about what's about to happen next. Peter has come, he's pulled out his sword, he takes off Malchus's ear, and what is the temple guard doing at that moment? The temple guard is moving forward. It is about to be a slaughter. Now, what do you think is going on in Peter's mind? Well, I think, as we've seen over and over, what did Peter do in Caesarea Philippi when Jesus said, the Son of Man is going to be arrested and killed? Peter takes Jesus' side and says, "Um, Jesus, let me explain something to you. Messiahs don't die. Messiahs don't suffer. Messiahs enact God's miraculous intervention and they win every battle because that's what my understanding of Messiah says they do. So when Peter pulled out his sword and took a swing at Malchus, what do you think Peter expects to happen? Peter expects Jesus to use his miraculous power, the same power that calmed the sea, the same power that healed the sick. The same power that spoke to a legion of demons and silenced them and sent them into a herd of pigs. Peter absolutely makes good on his promise. The problem, however, is he isn't really defending Jesus, he isn't really defending the Messiah. He's defending his idol of messiahship. Matthew 26, 52, Jesus steps into the fray. He says, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you not think that I cannot call on my Father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? I mean, think about that for a moment. Growing up in my church, one of our, one of our songs we sang often says, said, he could have called 10,000 angels, referencing this verse. Yet ironically, they miss it. Because a legion in the Roman army was 6,000 soldiers. Okay? So 12 times 6 is 72,000, not 10,000. But just imagine that for a moment. Jesus says, I could call 72,000 angels. Do you remember in the Old Testament what one angel did to a whole Assyrian army? 72,000 angels. Jesus says, don't you know that right now I don't need you defending me. If I wanted to be defended, I could call down a force that could wipe out the entire earth... 
But my father and I have a different plan. Yes, Peter defended him. But we must note that Peter is not attempting to defend the Messiah of God. He is, defending to de- he is attempting to defend his own distorted view of the Messiah. He's not attempting to defend the Almighty God. He is attempting to defend the idol of God that he has created in his own image. One betrayed him. One defended him. But in the end, what we see is that everyone abandoned him. Verse 50 says, Then everyone deserted him and fled. Zechariah 13.7 prophesied and says, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. These disciples who just a few hours earlier, every one of them swore they would never disown Jesus, even if they had to die with him. Remember, Peter wasn't the only one who said that. Ran like scared rabbits, leaving Jesus to face the mob alone. And Mark includes an account that many believe was of Mark himself in verse 51 and 52, where he says, A young man, wearing nothing but a linen garment, was following Jesus when they seized him. He fled naked, leaving his garment behind. In other words, the Roman soldiers grabbed his garment and he ran right out of it. Amos 2.16, a passage on the judgment of Israel says, even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day. Jesus, arrested, and every one of his disciples abandons him in that moment. One betrayed him, one defended him, Everyone abandoned him. And finally, we need to see that no one believed him. Think about it. How many times in the Gospels do we see Jesus telling them point blankly, I'm going to be arrested, killed, and then raised by it from the dead. He's told them that on multiple occasions. So think about it. They shouldn't be surprised by what is happening. Except for what? Except for the fact that when he was telling them what was going to happen, they were going, la, 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 you're the Messiah, you're going to make Rome pay for what they've done. And they could not hear what Jesus was saying. No one believed him. He had told them what was going to happen. And this puzzling story of the young man who ran away naked has an interesting connection in Mark 16, verse 5. Because you see, only Mark, in 16, in the story of the resurrection narrative, only Mark describes him, the angel, as a, quote, young man. And guess what he's wearing? A white robe. So what you have is that before his crucifixion, a young man flees naked. And after his resurrection, another young man wearing a white robe declares that Jesus is victorious. These two passages, I think, are tied together And Mark does this, I believe, to make the point that while the temptation is to fear and abandon Jesus, because remember, Mark is writing to a church that's facing persecution, that that while the temptation is to fear and to abandon Jesus, faith calls us to stand firm, knowing that ultimately Jesus is victorious. What a powerful story. Well, let's spend a few minutes boiling down some applications. Application number one, I think this story is calling us to, 
It's calling us to don't betray Jesus, but instead wait on him. Question, was Judas a traitor from the beginning? I don't think so. When do you think Judas decided to, quote, betray Jesus? I'm not sure. My hunch is that somewhere along the way, Judas became disillusioned and or believed that he could force Jesus' hand. That some believe, and I kind of lean this way myself, that Judas was so convinced that Jesus was this ultimate, military, miraculous Messiah, but that he was reluctant. And that Judas believed that by betraying Jesus, he would force Jesus' hand and cause the battle to begin. And that that's why Judas responded by killing himself, because it didn't play out the way he thought it would. But here's what we need to see in that. When some people see Jesus clearly, they react in anger because they find out that Jesus isn't who they wanted him to be. Again, a question I heard on Christian radio way back in Roswell in the 90s that has haunted me, or not haunted me, but it's been a reminder to me over and over, is the question, do you worship, who do you worship? The God who is, or the God you know? Peter and the disciples were worshiping the God they knew, and the God they knew was clouded by who they believed he ought to be. And so Judas, I think, when he saw Jesus not being who he was supposed to be, said, I'll make it happen, or else said, I can't believe you've let me down, and so therefore I'm going to hand you over. Either way, Judas' problem was the fact that he wasn't allowing Jesus to be Jesus. He wasn't allowing Jesus to be the God who is, but instead trying to force Jesus into a box that fit Judas' understanding of his world. And folks, we all struggle with that. In fact, why do people betray Jesus? Because they don't have the faith to see past the present and to trust that God knows what he's doing in spite of the mess of the present. And, you know, I have preached this point now in some form for probably 30 years. And 30 years later, it's so much harder for me to comprehend. Because there are so many things in life in our world that I shake my head and that just don't make sense to me. And I don't see how God is going to make all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. And so I understand the struggle of the disciples. I understand Judah's struggle. Because so much of me wants to scream and say, God, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't add up. I can't make this fit. And I think God sits back and in a very loving way smiles and says, Daryl, you're not supposed to be able to make it fit. Your place is not to make it fit, not to understand it, but to trust that my heart is good towards you. And that the love I expressed in sending my son to you shows you that no matter what, I am at work producing good fruit. And that, my friends, is incredibly difficult to hold on to. But that, my friends, 
is what faith is about. But then third, I want us to see from this passage that Mark calls us to don't defend Jesus, but instead proclaim him. You realize that Jesus doesn't need our defense? That the times we step up and think it's our place to defend him, we're being just like Peter, bringing a sword to a gunfight, bringing a sword in a place that human weapons are of no avail. God could call 12 legions of angels any time he wants to be defended. And yes, I marvel constantly at at God's reluctance, often unwillingness even to defend himself. How he will stand by and let people profane his name, let people tell all kinds of lies about him, and do nothing but continue to reveal his love. God doesn't call us to defend the faith. He calls us to proclaim the good news. When I grew up, when I was growing up in a uh, legalistic religious environment, I believed that, and I was even taught, that a good Christian knows how to defeat the arguments of others. And that if you really study your Bible, and if you really get all the proof text down, etc., etc., that you can go toe-to-toe and out-argue anyone. And i got to tell you, folks, I was actually pretty good at it. I was a Bible Bowl whiz kid. I knew the verses. I could have a great argument with my Baptist girlfriend or even some of the guys on the football team or something coming from a non-Christian perspective. And guess how much amounted from all those, any of those arguments I had? I don't think anything. Except possibly alienating people even more. Yeah, there is a place for apologetics. But that's not what God calls us to. I believe it's in Peter when Peter tells us to be ready to give a ready answer for the hope you have within you. That's a very loose paraphrase. (laughs) Okay? Don't have it in my notes. Wasn't planning on using it. But you see... In the background I grew up in, be ready with a be ready with an answer. And I thought that meant to be able to answer every question, you know, like why there's suffering in the world and why, you know, someone someone in some country who's never heard of Jesus is going to hell anyway. Okay? That's not what Peter's saying there. He says, have a ready answer for the hope that you have. Because guess what, folks? People can poke holes in every argument, in every point you can make that, quote, proves that God is real, that Jesus is real, that Jesus is the way of salvation, etc., etc. Especially today in our post-Christian world where Scripture is not given authority. They can make an argument against everything except one thing. My story. My hope. Because you see, when I tell someone, when I tell you, when I tell others, the path that I was on, who I would be without my faith in Jesus Christ, the harms that I have done in my brokenness, and the harms that I would have done at an even greater level if it weren't for Jesus coming into my heart and bringing his transformation... And to be able to say, and because of that, 
And because of the encounters I've had with him, I know that I'm loved. I know that I'm forgiven. And I have great hope for what God is going to do, (coughs) both in my life now and for eternity. There is nothing someone can say to that. I mean, they may think I'm foolish. They may think I'm delusional. But it plants a seed. It shares hope. We are not called to defend Jesus. We are called to just proclaim his goodness. Knowing that many are going to hear that proclamation, shake their heads and say we're fools... To which Paul says, I'm gladly counted as a fool for Christ. We don't defend Jesus, we proclaim him. But then third, we need to see that we're called to, to don't abandon Jesus, cling to him. Instead of running away, grab hold. During the reign of terror in Uganda under Idi Amin, death squads would go out every night to kill Amin's enemies. One Sunday morning as the people came to church, they literally had to walk over dead bodies of those who had been murdered the night before to get into church. When they got inside, the minister, a man named Kepha, began to preach the word of God. Even after the service had gone on for a couple hours, the people protested when he started to close. They cried out, no, no, we have nowhere else to go. We must feed on God's word. Keep preaching. Quite an unusual experience for a preacher. Kepha preached for another two hours. Still, they would not let him quit. He finally begged to leave for a little lunch and rest. The people waited patiently in his church for his return. He came back and resumed preaching. By late afternoon, their fear and terrible sense of abandonment had finally been overcome by the truth of God's word in his loving presence. As they closed the service, Kepha recognized Ida Amin's goon squad at the back of the church. As he opened the door to let them in, three men drew their revolvers and said, We have come to kill you. Kepha looked at them straight in the eyes and answered, My life is hidden in Christ, but if you ask me, I will pray for you. Utterly astounded, the killers just stared at him. Finally, they said, Would you really? Kepha said, Kneel down. They knelt down and he prayed for them. And then they left. And Kepha continued to preach the word of God. In times of crisis, don't abandon him. Cling to him. He is the only hope. And then finally... Don't miss the kiss. Again, the most amazing thing to me about the account of Jesus' arrest is the fact that Jesus receives Judas' kiss. Think about it. Jesus refuses to turn his back on Judas even in that moment. I mean, think about it. If I knew Judas was coming to betray me with a kiss, with a sign of affection, I would have seen him 50 yards away or 20 yards away and I'd have said, Judas, what are you doing? I would have called him out. I would have held up my hands like this and said, Okay, Judas, if you're going to betray me, betray me. But no way and you know what am I going to let you kiss me on the cheek. And yet even in that moment, 
Jesus received Judas' kiss. In the video series on the Gospel of Matthew, where the Gospel of Matthew is the only spoken words in the video, but they dramatize it and act it out, they do a beautiful job with this scene. Because in that scene, Jesus receives Judas' kiss and he gives him a huge embrace. And I think it's exactly right. Because you see, even in that moment, even in that moment of ultimate betrayal, Jesus says to Judas, Judas, I love you. Judas, I'm for you. I know what you're doing, and I still love you. (laughs) Yet when I pulled up my old notes from preaching on this passage in the past, I found that I used the lyrics from an old Petra song called Judas Kiss that I remember enjoying when I was in high school. I I loved the music, the words, you know, it felt like, okay, this is a song of conviction, But when I looked at those words, I cringed and realized that the song, and especially the way I used it, was actually a form of condemnation. Because the song asks questions in the context of, I wonder how it makes you feel when, and then gives things we all do, and then concludes with the chorus, it must be just like another thorn stuck in your brow. It must be like another close friend's broken vow. It must be like another nail right through your wrist. It must be just like, just like Judas' kiss. And yes, there is some truth there. You know, the enemy always uses mostly truth with a little twist to get to us. There is truth that our sin, our refusal to trust Jesus, does bring him pain. However, we must see clearly that even though our sin brings Jesus pain, he never turns away from us. If he didn't turn away from Judas in that moment... What in the world would he turn away from you and me? And what that tells me is that on my worst day, in my worst moment, in my greatest failure, there is Jesus, arms open wide, longing to embrace In my inbox, even this morning, I have an email that I have had in this some form, I don't know how many a thousand times by now. A man wrestling with sexual addiction who says, I just don't know that God can still love me. And I think of Judas' kiss. I think of Jesus' willingness to receive it. I think of his embrace. Again, as we will see as we continue in the Passion narrative, Jesus' triumphant cry on the cross was the cry, It is finished. To tell us thy, it's finished can also be translated paid in full. It means that every sin I've ever committed, every sin I will ever commit, no matter how heinous, no matter how horrible, no matter how much pain and trauma it causes the people in my world and my reality, they may not be able to get over it, they may not be able to forgive me for it, but guess what? Jesus is standing, arms open wide, to receive and embrace every single one of us. I don't care what you have done. 
I don't care what you haven't done. I don't care how many times you've done it or how many times you've promised God no more. Jesus will always accept your kiss. Jesus is always glad as glad can be to be with you and me no matter what. No matter what. And it's actually arrogance on our part to think our sin is greater than the price that he paid. Think about that for a moment. The price Jesus paid of his life, of not just even his life, but just of him leaving glory to come to earth in the first place. Let alone to be rejected and killed by us. The price he paid so exceeds our ability to sin that our thinking my sin is greater than the price he paid is an arrogant form of believing that my sin is greater than his sacrifice. And so that leaves us with only one choice. To fall on our knees and cry out, Lord, have mercy. And receive his embrace. And to know that we are loved far beyond anything we could ever imagine. Not because we've gotten it right, not because we've done it better than others, but simply because that is who He is. He is the God who loves us, 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 no matter what. Not because of who we are, but because of who he is. Let's pray. So Father, we come to you this morning in awe of this passage. In awe of your willingness to receive Judas' kiss. And so each one of us, Lord, if we are honest, if we look deeply at our own brokenness, we can see that it's exactly what we need. That we need to come to you right in the middle of our mess, exactly as we are, and just say, Lord, I come to you, trusting that you are the kind of God who would receive Judas' kiss. And if you would receive Judas' kiss, then I'm going to trust that you would receive me. And so Jesus, we thank you. We praise you and we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we leave this place, let's just, re just be reminded. God is not looking for us to show him how much we love him by getting it right, by doing things well. He's asking us the most important question. Do you believe that I love you? Do you believe that I love you right where you're at, as you are, not requiring anything on your part for you to accept my love. But do you believe that I love you? And when you have trouble believing that, think about Judas' kiss. And with that, we are dismissed.